Okay, so we need to continue here with the lymphatic system. And uh, we've gone through some of the basic anatomy of the lymphatic duct work, uh, but there are also some additional uh, lymphatic tissues and lymphatic cells uh, and organs that make up or con uh, combine to make up the lymphatic system. We're going to start with, <coughs> excuse me, lymphatic cells. So lymphatic cells. And really what the lymphatic cells are, these are cells that just simply have or confer some sort of lymphatic, lymph, lymph, lymphatic action. Okay, so cells with lymphatic action. And they're considered to be a loose aggregate, and that just simply means that these cells are loosely scattered within mucosal membranes of a variety of tissues. Okay, so really we should be thinking in terms of places like the esophagus or places like um, the appendix and the, um, uh, the, the colon and the small intestine. These are just going to be incorporated in some of those mucosal layers, just kind of scattered throughout. So it's just going to be like the whole screen is going to just be off. Okay. Sweet. <laughs> Mucosal membranes. And my computer just took a dump. I think we're good now. Maybe. <laughs> okay. Off to a great start today. Is that a big four? Yeah, sure. It's called a big four. The, the other three was a big three. Did you get that? Lymphatic cells and then lymphatic tissue. All right, so lymphatic cells basically just distributed kind of loosely within um, a, a very loose scattering or a loose aggregate of, um, of cells throughout the mucosal tissue layer of a variety of different organs. And then we have lymphatic tissues. And these are cells that the aggregate is, is tighter. So these are going to be, are we, are, what's going on? Ignore this. No, no, no. A, B, B, R, E. Aggregate. Okay, an aggregate is, it's actually sort of a geology term, but it's a collection of different types of, in this case, cells just kind of clumped together. It's not really a full tissue because it's incorporated in the tissue, but it's a distinct part of that tissue that is sort of separate. So this first one here is the colon, which is obviously part of the digestive system, but we have this aggregate called malt, which is a lymphatic patch of cells. <laughs> Just like randomly in there. Yep, so we have this aggregate of lymphocytes and... 
I mean, I was going to get there. This aggregate resides in the mucosal membranes as well. A variety of different tissue types. So really, the, the lymphatic cells versus lymphatic tissues, the cells are just kind of sort of scattered throughout. The tissues are going to kind of be clumped together, aggregated together. to be a little bit more substantial. And there's going to be two forms of these aggregates, lymphatic aggregates or lymphatic tissues that we can find in a variety of different tissue types. Okay, loose aggregates. And this is, it's kind of like cells, which are really loose aggregates, and then these loose aggregates, which are kind of an intermediate. And then we're going to find that we also have compact, compact aggregates as well. The loose aggregates, oops, um, this should be set over here. The loose aggregates um, are associated with protective coverings. And within these protective coverings, they're going to be near exterior openings and these are typically referred to by the acronym MALT. Okay, so you can see examples of some MALTs here, colon and uh, the esophagus near the opening, near the protective layer of these tissues, so towards the lumen near the opening up to the exterior of the body. MALT stands for mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. So mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. Now don't confuse this with things like the adenoids and the tonsils. These are going to be more specific organs. This is simply just tissue. So these are basically layers of cells that confer some sort of lymphatic protection or lymphatic function that are near the exterior of things like the colon or the esophagus. Compact aggregates are sometimes also referred to as lymphatic nodules. And they actually are a little bit more dynamic. And when I say dynamic, I mean that they actually will change in their appearance or in their structure and composition depending on status of the organism. So they are going to fluctuate in the presence <laughs> of or with infection. So when we increase infection or when we have an infection, we're going to have a higher amount of this compact aggregate or the lymphatic nodule. Um, and we're going to find them to be pretty constantly present, uh, this particular type of, of tissue. You can see here in the appendix um, some, uh, an example of lymphatic nodule. We'll also find these collection of lymphatic cells constantly in the lymph nodes and then some of our accessory organs, including the tonsils. And as you can see here on the board, the appendix as well. Now, there's one specialized group of lymphatic nodules. Uh, they're known as Peyer's patch. And these are actually going to be found. These are going to be found in the ilium.
which is one of the sections of our small intestine. Okay, so a little bit more well defined in the Pyres patch. You can see them stained here in this figure to provide lymphatic protection for food that's making its way through the digestive system. Okay, so these are just simply put, aggregates are collections of cells compacted or loosely structured inside of tissues that provide additional lymphatic protection to those, to those tissues in those areas. So the lymphatic system, you have the network of, of tubes and vessels. Then you also have these additional cells. But we also have accessory <coughs> organs. Now, the difference between a lymphatic organ and the cells and the tissues that we've just discussed is this is going to be a defined anatomical structure. It's actually going to be an organ rather than just incorporated into another tissue. So we are going to say that lymphatic organs have a defined anatomy. Because they are structured into persistent organs. I don't know what the deal is today, but I keep skipping letters, putting in the wrong letters. Bear with me. I'm going to blame it on the time change. All right, so if it's a persistent organ, it's going to have characteristics of an organ, things like connective tissue. And this connective tissue, just like we've already seen with other organs, is going to allow separation from other organs and other physiological systems. Now, because biologists just love to organize things and categorize things, when we look at the lymphatic organs, we come up with two main types based off of characteristics. So two main types of lymphatic organs can be found in the human. And we're just going to simply call them primary and secondary. And we'll start out with the primary, and we're just going to simply identify some of these primary organs. Okay, so here's an example of a couple of the primary organs. Uh, and and the, the characteristic that <coughs> sort of differentiates your primary from secondary is our primary organs are going to be the site of lymphocyte maturation. Okay, so our site of lymphocyte maturation. And as such, the lymphocytes exposed in these organs, they're going to differentiate to have a characteristic that's known as immunocompetency. In other words, they become immunocompetent cells. See, I'm missing an M. So immunocompetent cells. And what an immunocompetent cell, the, the characteristic or the function that arises with immunocompetency is these cells become able to respond to antigens. And antigens are proteins that basically flag other cells and other types of um, organisms and microorganisms that are invading microorganisms or invading cells. So these immunocompetent cells, when they interact with a cell that is marked with an antigen, they can mount what we would call an immune response. And you can see here that some of the examples include things um, like the bone marrow and the thymus. And in fact, when you think back on some of the 
cells that we've already talked about, both in the circulatory system and with the lymph, uh, lymphatic system. You probably recognize T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. These are immunocompetent cells. T lymphocytes come from the thymus. B lymphocytes come from the bone marrow. And they will enter circulation, and once in circulation, the T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes are mature lymphatic cells, are going to transfer or travel to our secondary lymphatic organs. Okay, so they are going to be secondary because they are the locations where our immunocompetent cells, our, our lymphocytes, are going to translocate to. So once they are mature, they enter into the circulation, and that's why we can pick them up in the red blood or in the, in the blood, and then they end up or wind up at secondary organs where they are actually going to have some sort of immune effect. And so places like the lymph node, which you should recognize as those organs spaced along the lymphatic system. But we're also going to find them located in the spleen and in the tonsils. And a special type of tonsil that's known as an adenoid. Okay, so primary, this is site of maturation. Secondary, this is where the cell translocates to really have its effect. Uh, the lymph nodes, we've already talked a little bit about lymph nodes located along the lymphatic system. Haven't talked in context of lymphatic system, bone marrow, or the thymus. We're going to get to that, and we'll get to the spleen tonsils and adenoids as, as well. Okay, there are two types of bone marrow in humans, red bone marrow and yellow bone marrow. Uh, yellow bone marrow is much... Um, red bone marrow is much more uh, prevalent in children, and then it begins to uh, wane away in, into adults. So you can see here red bone marrow in the adult. It's located just in a few locations. Uh, in particular, it will be present in flat bones and will be present in the head of both the femur and the humerus. So I'm just going to simply refer to those as limb bones, just for sake of simplicity. Now there's this other type of bone marrow called yellow bone marrow, which is actually really no lymphatic function at all. Uh, in children, there's a lot of red bone marrow um, throughout all of the bones, and then as we age, some of that red marrow that's located in places like the shaft of the femur or the shaft of the humerus begins to dissipate, and it becomes less and less uh, vascular, um, and it changes over to yellow marrow. So red marrow has two functions. One is to produce lymphocytes, and then the other is to produce other components of the blood. In particular, um, a lot of uh, or, or red bone cells, or, uh, red blood cells. I don't know what a red bone cell is. Uh, red blood cells. I know what that is. Are going to be produced here in uh, the bones as well. All right, the second tissue that we uh, have was the thymus. The thymus is a pretty, uh, pretty weird organ. It is actually going to be uh, a multi-system functioning organ. Okay, so multi-functioning organ. Some of the system or some of the, the function is going to be endocrine in nature. And a lot of that endocrine function has to do with uh, maturing the lymphocytes that get passed into the lymphatic system. But the thymus also actually has some lymph function as well. 
It's not just a producer or a mature of lymphocytes, but it's also going to have some lymphatic and immune function. Okay, it does act as a major site of lymphocyte production along with the bone marrow. But also generates hormones. That's the endocrine function. And these hormones release to influence lymphocytes that are already out in the body. So, um, in order to accomplish these tasks, histologically we would find two layers, and these two layers combine, two layers of tissue combine to produce and to process the lymphocytes. Okay, so before I move on from here, you can see uh, the the finest the heart would be right here, and so this is basically set right on top of the heart. Um, in adults, it actually becomes very much like a fatty tissue. It looks a lot like fat. In children, it's a little bit more, uh, um, I guess, epithelial in nature, uh, so a little bit different tissue, and then it sort of transitions towards this fatty tissue, uh, set right there on top of the heart. And again, two layers, and those two different layers are going to be the cortex and the medulla, which really shouldn't be that big of a surprise. The cortex, again, going to be our outer layer. And the cortex is going to protect developing cells from blood pathogens. Which is a good thing, right? We want to keep, if we're generating cells to wipe out pathogens or pathogenic cells, we want to keep these cells protected from those pathogenic cells. The component of the tissue, of the thymus tissue that confers this protection function is known as the blood thymus barrier. And the way that this blood thymus barrier is formed is we have reticular epithelial cells that interact with the capillaries. And in effect, wrap themselves around the capillaries to help regulate any sort of exchange that's occurring really just re uh, reducing the overall um, diffusiveness uh, of the, the capillaries. The capillaries are not as open, so to speak, as we find, say, in the kidneys or other locations where we have a large amount of capillary exchange. All right, the medulla. Which you can see here, we have cortex on the outside and then the medullary tissue uh, on the inside. The medulla is 
is going to be the location where from the cortex, cortex we have the lymphocytes undergoing that protected maturation process, then they are going to enter into the medulla. So they get transferred once they are mature, the lymphocytes gets transferred into the medulla. Now in the medulla, there is no barrier that's present. We no longer have that blood thymus barrier present. That's going to be located in the cortex or within the cortex to protect cells as they mature. These mature cells enter in, and once they enter into the medulla, they can be picked up either by the lymphatics or by the bloodstream itself. Now, what I'm trying to illustrate with this lower uh, example here is there is a transition from the cortex into the medulla. And remember, the cortex had those reticular cells that were present. And as we transition into the medulla, those reticular cells begin to differentiate. Because we have to, I mean, we have to have these reticular cells disappear because that's what's preventing the cells from crossing into the blood or into the lymphatic system. And so the reticular cells, as we enter into the medulla, those cells are differentiated. And really that's one of the reasons that we have two different layers of tissues because the reticular cells have undergone differentiation. <clears throat> and that differentiation results in what's known as a whorl, which is just a description of the way that the tissue looks. And you can, you can see that here. So we have um, this. Here's our, our thymus, some adipose tissue in there. This is connective tissue. Here's our cortex. It looks very different than <coughs> down here, which is going to be in the medulla. And you can see that the structure that exists here, there are places where it sort of looks like that structure still kind of exists. And this is that differentiation that's occurring. As we move into the medulla, those reticular cells are taking on a new shape, a new form, and they form this whorl-like structure. And these areas where there's still that whorl that's present is known as a thymic corpuscle. And the thymic corpuscle, corpuscle is just simply the answer to that differentiation process that now allows the mature lymphocytes access into the lymphatic system or into the bloodstream. And then they can circulate absolutely everywhere to have their lymphatic effect on all different types of tissues. Okay, so those are both considered primary lymphatic organs. We have a bunch of secondary lymphatic organs. We've discussed the lymph nodes in a little bit of detail. I'd like to come back now and talk just a little bit more about the lymph nodes. So here's an image of a lymph node, cross section of that lymph node, and you can see that there is a ton of stuff going on inside of a lymph node. It is considered to be the most abundant lymphatic organ. And you'll remember that there are some that are collected up in certain locations, and so you have things like inguinal lymph nodes or um, the uh, mesoteric lymph nodes. So um, gathered up in, in, in groups, and then also some of them just space kind of out at random. In the adult, there's about 450 lymph nodes. And these lymph nodes, these 450 or so lymph nodes, are going to provide two main functions. Now remember, it's a sec this is a secondary organ. Why is it a secondary organ? That's a question. Okay, so our mature lymphocytes are located here. 
So if our mature lymphocytes are located here in our secondary organ, you better believe that our main functions are probably going to be centered around how those mature lymphocytes are working. So one of the main functions here is to clean the lymph as that solution makes its way back up towards the subclavian veins. It's going to be processed by the lymph nodes and primarily being processed because of the presence of these lymphatic cells, these mature lymphocytes. Now, this cleaning of the lymph, really, you know, there's going to be particulates, broken down cells, broken down invading cells, and they're just going to get chopped up and recycled and we're going to get rid of the to uh, rid get rid of the toxins. We're going to reuse anything that we can reuse, amino acids and things like that. So that's the, the cleaning, and, and it's always happening. Regardless of status of the individual, infected or non-infected, you're going to have to continually clean your lymph. The active lymphocytes are also going to be present for what we refer to as immunity. And this is going to be a more specific response to invading organisms. And this is going to be destruction and then cleanup of invading cells. So cleanup is just dealing with the debris. Immunity is dealing with live organisms and destroying them. I thought I'd already gone over this, but maybe I hadn't. So maybe you weren't aware that they're concentrated in certain locations. But lymph nodes are concentrated in several locations. Uh, I'm going to give you seven that I want you to be familiar with. Kind of a tough picture to see, but um, really you're looking for these groups of basically green dots all over this individual. And there are seven major locations that you should be familiar with. And in fact, you're probably somewhat familiar with some of these, uh, especially the first one I'm going to talk about, which is the cervical lymph nodes, which we find these located in the neck. And they are really involved in monitoring the lymph that comes down from the head and the neck. And you've probably gone to the doctor, and the doctor has palpated your neck before, and is checking the size of your cervical lymph nodes. And if they're enlarged, then you probably have an active infection. And then he knows that you need to be treated with some sort of antibiotic or palliative care. You may have also received a check of your axillary lymph nodes. And these are going to be within the armpit region of the individual. And these lymph nodes are going to monitor the lymph coming in from the upper limbs and also throughout the chest area. The thoracic lymph nodes are going to be found within the thoracic cavity. <coughs> they are involved in monitoring the lungs, the airway, and then the mediastium, which is just sort of an uh, uh, area of tissue that's, that surrounds the layer over the heart and, and the lungs, primarily a blood supply. You'll have lymph nodes in the abdomen, the abdominal lymph nodes, and they are found in the abdominal pelvic wall, and they're going to monitor the urinary system and the reproductive tract. Yes. Are you more susceptible to like infection after that? Oh, would you say the tonsils? Yeah, like when you take a, yeah, something that has a lot Let's of hold off that. We're going to get to the tonsils here in just a couple of minutes, and we'll address what happens when we move. Them. All right, number five here is the intestinal and mesenteric lymph nodes. And these are going to, uh, we're going to find these monitoring 
um, the mesentery, the, the uh, appendix, intestines, and digestive tract. Mesentery is a uh, layer of tissue, primarily, again, blood supply that sits over. It's kind of like a flap. And it sits over the small intestine, just kind of flaps over the small intestine. The inguinal or inguinal lymph nodes um, monitor lymph coming from the groin and the lower limbs. And then finally, number seven is popliteal. And the popliteal is obviously this is back of the knee. So this is going to have um, uh, monitoring of the, the lower limbs, including the back, back side of the knee. So all of the lymph coming from those different areas cycle through one of these seven uh, lymph node locations. Okay, so tonsils. What exactly are tonsils? Uh, we actually have a variety of different tonsils located in a couple different areas. Most of these are going to be find, found in the nasal and the oral cavities or protecting those openings. And this will be tissues that are set at openings to the pharynx. Um, so really, base of the oral cavity, base of the navel, nasal cavity in the region of the pharynx. And the tonsils are going to guard against pathogens that are either coming in from your food, so ingested, you go up there to the calf today and you eat some french fries and a hamburger, you're also eating some bacteria. And just sitting in this room right now inhaling the air, you're inhaling viruses and bacteria. And we have tonsils that are going to help to remove or at least neutralize that, that uh, um, pathogenic effect. The way that this occurs, the function is very much guided by the anatomy of the tonsils. So you can see here tonsils at the base of the oral cavity. There's also some tonsils located uh, at a couple different places um, within the, the nasal and basically where the, the pharynx is converging those two cavities. Uh, again, the anatomy very important here. So this is uh, a cross section through a tonsil. And you can see that we have what kind of look like cilia, um, and then there are also uh, over the whole thing you have a layer of cells. And those outer layer, it's going to be epithelial cells. So our outer layer is epithelium. And then the infoldings that occur into the tissue. So we have all of these infoldings into the tissue. And they form these structures here. The infoldings form those structures there that are known as the crypts, the tonsillar crypts. And these tonsillar crypts, what you can see is surrounding the crypt. So the crypt is the, the yellow space here in, in, on the inside. And then the tissue itself, there are these little nodules. So lined with lymphatic nodules. And when in time you swallow food or breathe in air, particulates are going to get trapped inside of those tonsillar crypts. So those crypts are going to contain debris that's being removed. And it could be food particles, or it could be dead leukocytes. Or 
bacterial cells. So we basically just have a bunch of traps in these tonsillar crypts that are going to collect up and grab onto those particulates from a variety of different sources. Now, in addition to um, all of the debris that is found in these tonsillar crypts, we're also going to have antigenic chemicals. Antigenic anti chemicals. And these antigenic chemicals are going to help to generate or produce antigens for immunity. And as we produce those antigens, some of these particles are going to get marked and they are going to get destroyed, marked for, for destruction so that they can be destroyed and gotten rid of by the actions of other lymphocytes. Now there are three types of tonsils and basically they're differentiated on their location. They all have a very similar structure with the crypts and the lymphatic nodules uh, and then just collect up any of that debris or a lot of the debris as we're consuming food and beverage and breathing. One of those types of tonsils are known as the adenoids. They also can be referred to as the pharyngeal tonsils. And the pharyngeal tonsil, tonsils, or the adenoids, are going to exist as single groups of cells. And they are going to be located or found just beyond the nasal, ca uh, nasal cavity. Okay, so adenoids are one type. The uh, second type are the palatine. Palatine uh, tonsils are going to be paired as opposed to a single group. So these are a pair of tonsils, and these are what you're maybe most familiar with. These are located in the oral cavity. If you ever try to look at someone's tonsils, you're probably looking at their palatine tonsils. The last type of tonsil is the lingual tonsils, and these are actually going to be multiple tissue beds. And within these multiple tissue beds, we're going to find a single crypt per tonsil. But there are many of these single tonsils and single crypts. Uh, and you're going to find these located on the side of the tongue at its root. So way back at the beginning of the pharynx. All right, so you probably have all heard of people having their tonsils removed. And it used to be the standard uh, standard of practice 
And what would happen is they, you know, I mean, these are these tissues are dealing with a lot of bacteria and invading organisms, and so they would get inflamed uh, from time to time. And once they got inflamed, we would say, okay, let's just remove it and get rid of it, and then we get rid of the infection. And it's really effective at removing the infection um, if there's a problem. You've now just lost the tissue that's kind of the first line of defense for food and beverage consumption and air that we're breathing. And once we started uh, to have many, many cases of um, tonsils being removed, we began to see a decrease in immune function for those individuals. Um, in fact, today, really tonsils aren't removed anymore. Um, we try to treat with pretty heavy antibiotics to try to prevent the loss of the tonsils. The only reason tonsils will be removed is if they begin to impede on airflow into the lungs and begin to restrict restrict the airway and then we'll have to go in for emergency purposes to remove the tonsils but you know it's it's that's one part of medicine where the you know the tonsils were considered to kind of be okay well they're not really totally necessary now back in our evolutionary past they were very important but not so much anymore same thing with uh, the appendix and people saying well you know we've evolved because now we have new technologies for sterilizing our food and homogenizing and pasteurizing and things like that so they're not as important but really they were still really really important so we try to keep them around and just treat with heavy antibiotics uh, and so my generation i've had my adenoids removed many of my friends have had their tonsils removed if we were to survey your class it'd probably be about a 50 percent split maybe even uh more people who have not had them removed. Little kids today, 20 years from now, they're probably going to be one or two people in a class of 100 that would have had their tonsils removed. Yeah, Lindsay. What faces like make it okay to remove? Because like all my friends, my sisters, had them removed like yesterday. Then they probably got really, really inflamed. They could not get down with an antibiotic and treat it that way. And it might have started to cause or was expected to cause some problems with them airway function. So basically the decision probably was made. They're saying it's not getting better. It's only going to get worse. We got to do something else. Yeah. So when you have your tonsils removed, do they remove They just remove what's inflamed. Okay. Yeah. So you can just have your adenoids removed or you can just have your tonsils, pel pel uh, peltine tonsils removed or lingual tonsils removed, whatever's inflamed. Your body can't compensate for what's lost. Like your immune function is reduced. Yeah. Yep. And it's not like, oh man, I don't have my tonsils anymore. I'm gonna the common cold is gonna kill me. But it, it is a loss of a loss of important function. Our time. All right. Um, why don't we stop there? We'll pick up with the spleen. Yes. So let me let me get that in there. End of exam. End for exam number two, which will be on Friday, which I guess is like about March thirteenth. Yeah.